Welcome back to the Unanimous Decision Podcast. I'm your host, D Palm. Find me on Twitter at D Palm66. This podcast is brought to you by, of course, the MTR Network. You can follow our network on Twitter at the MTR Network. It's your one stop shop for entertainment news, movies, TV, video games, podcasts, comic books, politics, and now sports too. Um, well, we're back. Uh, week nine's in the books. Uh, we all heard last week. I kind of got in front of the uh, Georgia Florida outcome that I kind of predicted. We're going to talk about that just a little bit today uh, before we get started. Too far, uh, rolling too forward. Not any new five star reviews. Not a big deal. But if you want to hear your voice heard on the podcast, leave a five star review on the unanimous decision feed. We'll be sure to read it on the air the next week. Also, all our shows are now being. Uh, shared via YouTube as well. So when you've got your, I know you guys are high tech. You got your, uh, you got your earbuds in. You're listening to us on podcasts. You might have family or friends who aren't as pod savvy. Do me a huge favor. Go to the MTR Network page on YouTube. You can find all the unanimous decisions, all of our Super Tuesday podcasts, all of our character corners, all of our reviews, um, all the insanity checks. They're going to be there for easy consumption, easy sharing. It's a great way to make sure more people get involved. Leave comments there. I can't promise I'll read them, but I'll promise it. I'll put it on my list of things I probably will forget. Um, if you have anything else you want to send to the podcast, if you already left a review and you still want to say some more, make sure you email us at udpodcast at gmail.com. We are brought to you today, as always, by our good friends over at Tweaked Audio. Uh, Tweaked Audio is your one stop. It's a great place you can go. All your audio needs from over-the-ear headphones to earbuds to the wireless joints for the Bluetooth. Make sure you use the uh, promo code REVIEWS when you check out. Get 33% off and a free 100% lifetime warranty. This is true. This is real. I got these headphones from my brother for Christmas. He got them through Tweaked. He was sure to make sure that I got the warranty information. My dog stepped on them. I got new ones in like a week. We all break headphones. It's not because we're careless. It's because life sucks. So make sure you've got a backup pair lined up. Go to Tweaked Audio Reviews in the checkout. 33% off. Let's get going. I'm not alone. I've got a guest. My guest is, and if you've heard me, if you came to us from Doogee Podcast, first of all, welcome. God bless you. Second of all, you may have heard uh, me with, how do I describe you, man? With, with a regularly occurring guest who has almost as many hats as I do. I'm going to read the copy he sent me as we're in way of his introduction. It will never be this formal again because guess what? He's definitely coming back. My guest today is a co-host on the morning show, weekdays, 6 to 10 a.m. on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref. That's at 960 The Ref on Twitter. You can also hear him every Wednesday on the Ref Recap Podcast, a show I have not been invited on yet, on 960theref.com. And finally, he's one of the mouths of the South Atlanta United podcast for DirtySouthSoccer.com. Uh, brought to you by SB Nation. Follow him on Twitter at Sam J. Franco. What up, Sam? Well, first of all, that invitation must have gotten lost in the mail. So we will make <laughs> sure to uh, to fix that and uh, get it uh, forwarded off to the right address. But Daniel, thank you for that uh, awesome introduction. And thank you so much for having me on. I'm looking forward to our close to an hour today of talking all things sports. We have a lot of great topics to get to. And I'm super pumped about it, man. Well, let's get started with this. So you grew up a Georgia fan like I did. And now... I think incontrivably you could be described to a very large segment of the fan base as one of the go-to voices of the dogs. I know you do some of the, the baseball and soccer calling those things live. How does it feel to, to have people like you and me, like you and I grew up, let's be honest, Larry Munson. That's the voice oh, yeah. of Georgia. For me, athletics. I honestly, when I was in Columbia, I would watch Georgia games. I would watch the tape Georgia games after we played our games or if, they, if we played early, I'd watch them live. But I'd mute the TV and listen to Munson's call. How does it feel to be kind of like, not obviously you're no Larry Munson, no offense, but you're on the path to being to someone who's ingratiated himself with Bulldog Nation as someone who's related to sports in that way? Oh, first of all, no offense taken. Uh, <laughs> nobody will ever be Larry Munson. And, and honestly, you know, I do the uh, the PA announcing for baseball, soccer, and the women's and men's basketball team. So it's a little bit different. But at the same time, you know, if you're coming to a basketball game, you know, you're hearing me and it's kind of part of my job to help get the crowd into everything. And especially this year for basketball, you know, the team has such a great slate with Texas coming in, Marquette coming in, right. Kentucky coming in, Florida coming in. I mean, there are some huge home games of the Stegman Coliseum this year. And this team is supposed to be pretty good. So obviously having all of that and, and I love that part of doing what I do. And obviously talking, uh, you know, on the radio here in Athens every morning is, is something that, you know, like you said, I get to 
kind of talk to the Bulldog Nation right. every day. But, you know, that it's it's one of those things where even, you know, and I'm, we'll get to this later, but I, I just got back from Jacksonville earlier today and, and some friends and I went out on Friday night and just kind of randomly running into people and they were like, you know, hey, you're San Franco, you know, and, and, and you know, I'm not a big headed person really at all. Like, I don't ever get like, you know, I don't ever say, oh, see, these guys recognize me or whatever. But I just love like talking to people and I, I, about stuff like that. And I love getting to share my experience really with everybody. That's why, you know, you'll see me on Twitter. You know, I, I tweet everything, you know, everything <laughs> I do, I tweet. And everything I do, I'm trying to share. And, and my boss always makes fun of me and says, yeah, uh, you know, we will never have a problem finding you because, you know, you're always <laughs> on social media, checking in here, doing this here. So, you know, if anybody's ever looking for you, you are not going to be easy to hide. So I, I'm all about just interacting with people and stuff like that. And, and, and really, I feel blessed to have the job that I have and, and get to do what I do every day. So I always like to pay it forward, you know, and, and that's really that's really what, uh, you know, I love about my job more than anything is just getting to a. Uh, so just to experience everything from really both sides, kind of the fan side and the uh, the media side of things. So it's uh, it's funny because, you know, obviously I'm at the game yesterday covering it for 960 The Ref. But, you know, before the game, I'm sitting out with friends, you know, hanging out, and looking at all the tailgates going on and everything. So I, I get to kind of do things from both ends. And so I always enjoy doing that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's really awesome. Man. And, and I got to ask, how, did you go into school thinking you wanted to practice the audio arts or was it something that kind of, not fell in your lap, but kind of a path that made itself available to you later. Well, it's interesting because I actually, you know, when you go into UGA and you study, you know, in the broadcast medium, when I was in school and they've obviously upped their game a little bit in terms of adding a sports, uh, I guess, a concentration into the major there over in the Grady College. But when I was there, we didn't have that. And really, when you majored in broadcast news, they were getting you ready for like local TV news or like working in a newsroom or like working at CNN or something like that. And that's not really what I wanted to do. So I went out and forged my own way on the WUOG, which is the, the University of Georgia Student Radio Network. And I had a, you know, I started as a producer there and then I got my own show. So I had my own show for like two years. So it was really about just kind of getting the reps, so to speak, in there and practicing and getting comfortable doing that. And uh, and with with UGA, too, it's funny because it just goes to show you how many different ways you can go in my Grady News Source class, which was the local TV or the local school news every night. You know, there was a Monday, Wednesday class and a Tuesday, Thursday class. Maria Taylor was in my class, uh, obviously, of ESPN. And it was great actually bumping into her uh, at the Tennessee game. You know, we got to kind of catch up. And, and obviously, she's gone on to bigger and better things with, with the SEC Network and, and ESPN and all that stuff. But it was just crazy because me, her, and like one other person are the only people that really stuck with the media path because, in all honesty, it isn't the easiest business to get into just because there's so much um, competition, you know, for these jobs. So it, it definitely is something where you've got to be patient. You've got to take your lumps. But it, it was really cool kind of seeing her and seeing where she's gotten and obviously me kind of keeping it more local, but still loving every minute of what I do. Uh, it, it's interesting, though, because back then the way that they tried to kind of say, and I even had a lot of professors, and I've you know called them out on my radio show many times where they're like, you're never going to get a job in sports. You know, you need to go this way or you need to go that way. But in the bottom line, don't ever listen to anybody if they tell you you can't do something. I mean, I know that it's going to be tough, but – Sometimes you just got to stick it out, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to have uh, been able to have a, a great support system that allowed me to be patient and to get to where I'm at today. Well, Sam, I speak for all dog fans when I say I'm glad that you stuck it out, and I speak for all of us who are engaged in independent media because that's really what this is. I think it's been really interesting because you and I have known each other via the internet for a couple of years now, but uh, we've broken bread in my home. We've watched wrestling together. Uh, right. I consider us friends. I think it's really it, – it's been interesting for me and, and, and kind of inspirational for me to watch you go from that 968 to – and all the things you do for Georgia football and expand your footprint into the independent media, into SB Nation, into Miles of the South, into developing the, the 960 – or 950 podcast, excuse me. I think it's just been great, and it's, it's something I, I think all our listeners should do well will follow you. Uh, you'll be a little bit over-inundated with Georgia tweets and probably um, a lot of crow eating revolving around Dwight Howard, which will happen later today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's called a tease in the business. Uh, but uh, I just really think uh, I, I think that uh, it's, yours is a great story, and I really do appreciate you coming on there and uh, on here and uh, carrying forward what we started over at Juju Podcasts. 
Yeah, no, and, and Daniel, you've been a, obviously a great friend to me throughout all this, and obviously I love coming on your show. I, I love it's all about exposure, and I think one thing that you when you and I were kind of planning this out, you, you would ask me, you know, give advice to people that want to get into the medium. Never, ever, ever turn down an opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing because any little thing here and there, you're going to network with people, you're going to meet people. Uh, for example, I just started doing a thing. This week was the first time I did it where um, 247 Sports and a guy named Alan Bell, who is their managing editor for NFL content, asked me if I would start doing a weekly thing with them where he sends me a couple of questions about the upcoming Falcons game that week, and I answered them. So now, and you know, this before when I gave you that thing to introduce, I even add this in. Now I'm doing that once a week for 247 Sports. I'm doing like Falcons preview. So that's the thing. Never turn down an opportunity because especially in my business, I mean, we're an AM radio station. You never know in five years and 10 years, what it's going to be like, what is going to be happening with the medium. And that's why I'm trying to get so involved with podcasting and things like this, because this is the future. The on demand content is what people want. They don't want to have to be constrained to listening to something. For example, my show, we have a very good fan base and I love all of our fans, but six to 10 for a lot of people isn't an ideal time. You know, morning drive is good for some people, but at the same time, a lot of people want to listen to the whole show. And when you're driving to work, you know, in that time, you get to hear snippets and, and bits and pieces. But I'm telling you, on-demand content podcasting is the wave of the future. So that's where it's going. So, again, never, ever turn down opportunities. If somebody asks you to do something, whether it's interning, whether it's shadowing for a day, whether it's, you know, just uh, just hooking on with someone for a little while and, and learning from them, never turn down those opportunities because people don't forget people that are willing to to do those things 100 percent. all right man let's talk about this is something interesting because i had you on the old show a good about a good bit and i never really talked on your preference talked on your expertise of college football well, we've got you here we're in the midst of college football season we had a crazy saturday last saturday in october um they started the, saturday kicked off with nine unbeaten teams four lost five are left um it was crazy yeah, it was. And, uh, you know, obviously it was uh, it was just one of those days where a lot of people fell by the wayside. And even teams like an Ohio State that lost to Penn State, they had a really tough game against Northwestern and, and kind of escaped by the hair on their chinny chin chins. And a team in the SEC that, you know, a few weeks ago was undefeated and feeling really good about their chances in Tennessee has now lost three straight games to Alabama, or I guess to Texas A&M, to Alabama, and now to South Carolina. And for those of us Georgia fans out there, and, and I'm not, well, you know what? I'm going to toot my own horn here because I called this. I said, Butch is going to Butch. It's going to happen. And obviously, Alabama and Texas A&M are tough opponents, but there's no way they should have lost to South Carolina. I mean, come on, Georgia beat South Carolina. So for yeah. Tennessee to lose that game, that was terrible, and I'm sure that Tennessee fans are going to have Butch Jones right back on the hot seat for that. So you kind of have like to. It, it was a crazy Saturday. You're totally right. Speaking of seats that may have gotten cooled down Saturday, Charlie Strong picked up a big win against Baylor, 35-34. More and more is coming out against that Baylor team about some of the things that have been not just alleged, but like literally taken to trial. I got to ask, and I, I've talked about this with some of my friends. It's interesting to watch a program that hasn't been a big program all of a sudden become a big program, and then you think that they've bypassed all those pitfalls that those big programs have, but you realize that they've just been hidden. Do you think yeah. that the Baylor thing, let's call it, let's, let's, let's say that they do what they should do in clean house. Well, let's, let's, let's hope that they don't levy punishments against incoming students, but they very well might. Does, was this a Baylor thing, a flash in the pan? Are we nearing the end of that Baylor run, or do you think this is, um, especially in the dilapidated Big 12, a step of national prominence that's, just a stumble on their way. No, I think this, I think this is going to be something that affects them for a while, just because the, the media backlash against Baylor has been pretty severe and deservedly. So because what our Riles was doing there in terms of, you know, not having the, the proper control over their program was bad. And here's the thing for a school like Baylor. I mean, it's in Waco, Texas. That is not an easy place to recruit to. Right. So they're always going to have to go after, at least if they want to be successful and be up near the top, they're a school that's always going to have to go after those kind of questionable or iffy guys in terms of character. You know, maybe maybe the, the guys that some schools pass on because it's not worth the risk, Baylor has to take that risk. And they did, 
And unfortunately, it came back to bite them. And obviously, there were much bigger problems than just the football team. There was, you know, the entire administration, the way that Baylor handles things. It's almost like they were this, you know, holier than thou Baptist institution that didn't want to have their name dragged in the mud. So they just tried to discredit all of these young women that were coming out and saying, hey, these things are happening to us. And that was flat out embarrassing and wrong. So for Baylor to have done what they did, I think this is going to affect them for a long time. I don't think Baylor, and I thought this year would be their last year where they could be pretty good just because they still have a lot of those players on the team and they still have talent on the right. team. But th- that's going to start to catch up to them. And I really don't think, A, a they're going to get a high-profile coach. They, they're going to have to hire someone from a pretty small school and hope that that guy can catch lightning in a bottle. And B, it's like I said, you're in Waco and all of this stuff surrounding that program. I think if you're the other coaches in the Big 12, in particular at a place, or even like Texas A&M, I think you're going to kind of feast on Baylor going down here. Yeah, I think that's part of the problem. Is Like you said, this is a small school in a small town that suddenly got big school, big town problems. Um, the other thing is that, like you said, A&M, once they, once they moved to the SEC West, you opened up Texas to the SEC West. And if I'm competing, not just with the Texas and Oklahoma's, the only two powers of mention of note in the Big 12 and why you know getting a championship game was a horrible idea, if you're competing with those two schools and Alabama and LSU and Ole Miss and Mississippi State, the number one uh, player in Texas last year went to Ole Miss. Like, you've got to realize that that landscape, that footprint, it's not as big as you think in Baylor and Waco. And a misstep like this, I think it sends you right back to the relevancy that some would say the strata of college football says you belong in. Um, Michigan beat uh, Michigan State late. That was a great game. Clemson finished a move to 8 0 against FSU. Um, the Huskies out West continue to beat people. I don't know what to say there. Um, I'm glad they're doing it. I'm glad there's something happening out West to make me pretend to stay up and not be uh, um, in irrevocably altered by the time those games start. <laughs> um, the next four we're talking coming out, like you said, Ohio State's looking out and outside looking in. Louisville probably has the longest shot of getting into the big four, but they've got Lamar Jackson, dude. And yeah, they, I don't care what you think about UVA. I don't care what you think about the rest of that game. That fourth quarter he put on Virginia, my goodness. Yeah, and I feel kind of bad for really anyone else uh, that is contending for the Heisman Trophy. I will say this, though. If Alabama loses to LSU and Leonard Fournette has a huge game, I don't think that's going to happen. But at the same time, there is a little bit of magic going on in Baton Rouge with Coach O, Ed Orgeron, taking that team over. And that game is going to be at night, most likely. I say most likely. Well, duh. It's going to be a night game in Baton Rouge. That is always a tough, tough environment to go into. So if LSU somehow pulls off the shock of all shocks and beats Alabama, Leonard Fournette will have to have a big game. And if he does, then I think he obviously gets into that conversation. But it it starts and ends with Lamar Jackson right now. What he has done this year has been pretty remarkable and it kind of pains me to say that because of my disdain for Bobby Petrino and Todd Grantham that uh, that kind of run that team. But that obviously has nothing to do with that kid. And that kid is just having one of the most special seasons we've seen in college football in a long time. Yeah, I'll tell you also caught my eye yesterday was uh, Peppers at Michigan. Oh, Jabril Peppers is fine. Wow. Like, I, yeah. I don't know, man. I've seen him a little bit this year. That was the first time he really jumped out on screen for me. And uh, he's not going to win it. I think, like you said, Lamar Jackson's his title will to abdicate her by injury or by uh, things falling off a cliff. But, yeah, I think you should get an invite to New York, see the city, um, you know, get away from Michigan. In the <laughs> yeah, I like that. You're like, yeah, let them go see Times Square and everything. They're not going to win the award. But, yeah, give them the whole experience. But, uh, you know, if you don't know about uh, Jabril Peppers' story and, and where he's come from, uh, that that is something that, obviously, you need to go check out. I mean, the guy came from very, very tough beginnings. And for him to have gotten where he has is obviously a, a triumph of all triumphs there. So go check that out if you haven't seen it. But, yeah, he's a kid that is definitely deserving. And then um, also I saw uh, Scott Van Pelt uh, going off on this. Uh, and, you know, I, I would agree that uh, I would agree that this is probably a case. But Donnell Pumphrey, uh, the running back there, is uh, putting up just absurd numbers. So he's probably a guy that should get to New York as well. But, again, none of them are going to be able to – surpass what Lamar Jackson has done at this no, to this no, no. I think it's I think it's all all it's all academic at this point uh speaking of academic 
So they have to play the game, right? Like Georgia has to play Florida. <laughs> like I, I understand that intellectually. Um, I don't know if you heard last year, last week's podcast. I had my friend Justin from Three Fifths Podcast on. He uh, he's a Florida fan, a vowed Florida fan, and I tried to explain to him how he and his school had ruined my childhood. And uh, it wasn't as close as the score was. Say that much. No, no, it was uh, – it. look, I know that Florida won by 14 points. It was 24 to 10. It was a sloppy game. But Georgia was just never really in it. I mean, other than the one drive where Jacob Eason showed that promise that we've all ex- expected and hoped that he would show. I mean, obviously he did it against Missouri on that game-winning drive up in Columbia. But the drive where Georgia scored their touchdown, and he, he found uh, Riley Ridley in the end zone. He made some amazing plays on that drive. But – there's just way too much wrong with this team for a freshman to be going through what they're going through right now because, or what he's going through right now, because the offensive line is playing terribly. Uh, The wide receivers in general aren't doing enough. And quite frankly, I don't think the play calling is doing a lot to help this kid out either. I, I think that especially against Florida, it was extremely predictable in the first half. It was a lot of run, run, pass, punt, run, run, pass, punt. And, you know, just not having that creativity and you need that kind of creativity against a team like Florida, against a team that was the number two defense in the country going in. And they continued to play that way. And quite frankly, I think Georgia, you know, played right into their hand. Yeah, I think that um, the only flashes of anything positive for Georgia, particularly offensively, happened when when Florida made mistakes. Uh, blowing coverages because I didn't think that honestly he'd have enough time to get the ball down. Like there was that drive. He said, like we saw the flashes where they would lose contain and he would get the ball downfield behind some coverage. You can't live on busted coverage. You just no can't. because eventually, well, eventually it's going to get corrected and exactly. Florida corrected. And <laughs> those coaches get paid too. <laughs> right. I mean, well, they made, they made adjustments and quite frankly, Georgia did not make any adjustments on offense. And Jimmy was running around for his life a lot in this game. And that's not good because he's about as mobile as Drew Bledsoe. So, I mean, he's it's just not a good thing when you've got him running around. Although I will say this, and this is something he needs to improve on, there were a few times where he would flush out of the pocket when he didn't need to. There were some times yeah. when the pocket was there and he could have stepped up and made a throw. Instead, he get jumps out of the pocket, and, and he's not good when he's out of the pocket. In his defense, uh, he's been conditioned by that line to, to jump early. <laughs> That's fair. That is fair. That is fair. The offensive line, believe me, has not been good enough. And quite frankly, when you have a kid from Rhode Island as your starting left tackle, you know, this kid was playing in the FCS last year, and now he's playing in the SEC, you know, the toughest conference in the country. That's just not, especially on the lines of scrimmage, it's the toughest in the country. Yeah. You know, that that's just asking too much from someone, quite frankly. I got a question for you. So we're going to talk um, a little bit more about this in a second. How do you feel about year one Kirby right now? We sit four, Georgia sits four and four, two and four in the conference, heading in November. I uh, got a stretch of games. We're probably going to take pick some losses up in. No, I agree. Now look, Georgia's got to win two games to get bowl eligible. Where do you see two wins? I mean, Georgia should beat Louisiana Lafayette, but at the same time, you go back to a game with like Georgia on the rest of the schedule. Kentucky just or off of Missouri this weekend. So you can get a win, especially, you know, it's a night game. So, you know, they'll have plenty of chances to get looped up, if you know what I mean, uh, yeah. you know, those Kentucky fans. And it's it's the week before basketball season starts. So they won't have transitioned to basketball mode just yet. So that's going to be a tough game for Georgia. Tech's going to be a tough game for Georgia. Auburn, the way they're playing right now, I think – I don't think Georgia – has really a, a much of a chance to win that one unless they can change some things dramatically. So it's going to be really, it's going to be really tough for Georgia to pick up two wins here. I, I know that, you know, we'll say Louisiana Lafayette is one. Where's the other one? So exactly. it's going to be tough. And, and, and none of this is an indictment on Kirby other than the fact that I don't, I don't know if the Jim Chaney thing was a good hire just because right now I'm not really in love with his play calling, but all of that needs time. But quite frankly, the talent isn't there. And that goes back to the previous staff. I mean, Mark Rick wow. gave up recruiting offensive linemen, it seems like. I mean, they just didn't do enough. And, and I, I, you know, 
it's just a, it, it's a bad situation. Look, you didn't have, and, and this is kind of a perfect storm because you're never going to have two scholarship kickers or two scholarship punters. But this team didn't have a scholarship kicker, punter, or long snapper. I mean, that's not good. Again, it's kind of the perfect storm there, but they're not good enough on the offensive line. They didn't have enough depth at receiver, and that's something that Kirby's going to change because if you look at recruiting right now, Kirby did a really good job of keeping some of the big guys in-house last year, and this class coming up is going to be one of Georgia's best in recent memory. So I want to give him time. I don't – there's a lot of, you know, overreaction of people like, Georgia should have hired Tom Herman or blah, blah, blah. It's like, look well, – yeah, If Tom Herman was on the table, we should have hired Tom Herman. Let's just – Well, there was, there was a thing where Tom Herman was like, yeah, I would have loved to have talked to Georgia, but they never reached out to me. And if that's the case, then that's, that was probably a mistake. I have a question, least, I have a question you for least you. Gotta, you at least got to talk to the guy. You at least yeah. got to – 100%. I have a question for you, and I, I understand what you're – the excuses you're making for some of the current program, and that's fine. Do what you gotta do. Hey, whoa, excuses. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, let me let me ask the question. Okay. If you slip from ten wins with largely the same, like we didn't graduate a whole bunch of world beaters. Agreed. Right, but the offense. Okay, well, let me finish the question. Okay. Okay. To go from ten wins to possibly not being eligible at the same cast, it speaks to my original concern last year, where I said that Greg McGarry may have cost himself his job, and the reason I say that is because. It's one thing for people to say, oh, remember, watch Nick Saban at Bama. He lost those first two years, and then everything got righted. That's fine, but you're dealing with a fan base that's used to 10. You and know? no, I, I, get, I get that. I get what you're saying there, but I will say this. If they hadn't have made a move, what does this team do with Mark Rick as head coach? Because there's a lot of question marks there. Brian Schottenheimer, is he still around? God, if, I hope not. That, neither do I. So that's what I'm saying. Like, well, who does Mark Rick hire to be offensive coordinator? You know, well, what does Mark Rick do with, with this team? I'm, I'm just, all I'm saying is in a vacuum, you can you can play the what-if game, but it's largely the same cast. We're looking at legitimately going from a 10-win team to potentially a 5-win team. I think that the AD, because we'll talk about this in a second, the AD may be the one in trouble here. Do you agree with that or not? That See, that's a tough one because I, I just don't know if – I don't really think so. I don't okay. think this is. I don't think this is a. This is an, an athletic director issue. I think what it is is people in the know and people that that have that study the program and know what's going on realize. And when Kirby Smart was hired, I'm sure he said, "Look, this is something I'm going to need some time to make into my own." All, all, so, I'm, all I'm saying is, it's different to say I need some time than to not make a bowl in your first year. It's a big uh, drop. It's not a drop. And the thing is, what people were telling me for for years was that the job was, that Rick wasn't doing enough with the job. And then now, I'm, all I was saying was, if you think that the Georgia job is elevated to where you think it is, then you can't hire a first-time head coach. You can't go coordinator. That's what happened. We are where we are. We'll see what happens. And the reason I ask if you think the AD is in trouble is because there's an article that came out in USA Today this week where they kind of went through, because most of these coaches, you have to realize, are state employees. Their, right. their, their entire deals are legally obtainable. And right now, the reason I tell you that McGarity's job is more in trouble than Kirby's is because Kirby's buyout, which was released this week, is thirteen and a half million dollars. <laughs> yeah, and coaches are doing good work there. I mean, that's, that's there's <laughs> no doubt something. about it. Their, their agents are their agents are doing really good work there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think more than anything, you have to look at how Georgia as an entire entity runs, and I think the current athletic administration has the support of not only the the president and everybody that's involved in that side of things, but I think that, you know, when you have a guy that's quote unquote a Georgia guy, I, I think that he is, is firmly entrenched here. And again, I don't think that I don't think that any of this really goes there because you can't, after one season of a coach, make that kind of determination. I think you have to wait and, and look, next year is going to be a big year for Kirby, no doubt about it. But I really think that year three is where you're going to be able to judge. And I don't think Kirby's going anywhere until, you know, at least after year three. If he can't get the job done then, then maybe you start to see something. But, you know, you just you just fired a very long-term head coach, and I do think that was the right move because a relationship can get stale. And I think that's what happened. I think that, that Coach Rick, quite frankly, was very tired of the backlash of the fan base. 
because more and more it was starting to pile up on him and everybody was calling for his job. Every, not everybody, but a big chunk was calling for his job. A big chunk of people were not showing him support. And I think that going to Miami, it's, it doesn't appear to be as much pressure and, it, and you can see it. I know that they've lost four games in a row down there, but he, he's, he's smiling a lot more. He seems more engaged in the job. There were times here where he just didn't really seem into it anymore. So I think that it was a good divorce for both sides. Well, we will see. Uh, five wins doesn't sound very uh, positive to me. Let's talk more about the buyouts. Um, okay, so we've seen like this, this, this broken. If you haven't noticed, if you haven't read it, I'm going to put the link in the show notes. But it's a breakdown of all of these head coaches who, if they were fired today, what they would be owed in buyout. And it's really, really interesting because you start to realize that Oh God, they're invincible. <laughs> well, it's a lot of money. I mean, look, Les Miles had a huge buyout. Uh, you know, when he just got fired from LSU, so it gets to a point where the buyouts are a lot of money, but for the big schools, it's not that big of a deal because the boosters are the ones that are going to be taking care of that anyway. You say that now, but there's a reason why three and three and however many last year Tech kept Paul Johnson because they couldn't afford the buyout. Well, because well, you're, we're comparing LSU boosters to Tech. No, I'm, no, I'm not. The buyout okay. for LSU Miles was $8 million. The buyout for, uh, for uh, who's it? Paul Johnson is, is I think, 6.9 right now. They did not fire Les Miles because of the weirdest thing ever last year. He changed nothing. They ended up firing this year. Really dumb fire. I don't know. I'll well, they, they didn't fire him last year because Jimbo told him no. So, you know, they they, they were kind of – screwed there they, you know they thought they thought for sure and lsu's boosters and lsu's administration thought for sure that jimbo fisher would would come home so to speak you know but he didn't because quite frankly i wouldn't leave florida state for lsu anyway you know why would, yeah. much easier much easier to get to the playoff from florida state right now than it is lsu because you don't have to deal with the emperor i'd be gone Real, um, real. Yeah, oh yeah. So I'm just saying, <laughs> and Georgia Tech's another thing altogether because yeah, other, what they, what they did with their what they did with their basketball program, all of their and quite frankly, I, you know, their athletic director have you know one of them left to go to Clemson, one of them left to go to was it Purdue, I believe was uh, where the other one went. So that's the thing, they left. If I were Tech's administration, I would have fired them because they did terrible negotiating on these contracts. I mean, Paul uh, Paul Hewitt basically had like a lifetime deal because it, it automatically renewed every few years or like every, I think it was every year. It like renewed like every year. So terrible deal for Hewitt, another terrible deal for Brian Gregory. And then they're going to pay him. And now they got Pastner in there and then they're, they're just, they're paying basketball coaches. So they didn't have the money to go fire Paul Johnson. Do you think that the, uh, the, the, the heft of these buyouts is good or bad for college athletics? <sighs> It's bad for college athletics, but it's good for the coaches. I mean, it helps their security. Who cares about the coaches? No, but I'm, but I'm <laughs> okay. Now you're not letting me think. But what, but what I'm saying is, yeah, it's great for the coaches, but no, it's terrible for college athletics because, quite frankly, if you don't make a great hire and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't translate into wins on the field, it's so hard for you to fire your coach again unless you're a big program that's got big money boosters that don't really care. And that's ultimately why Les Miles got fired this year because the boosters were like, all right, we'll take care of this. So I think that it's bad for college athletics. Look, it's a bad look for college athletics anyway because, you know, you've got these coaches making ridiculous amounts of money and they can be terrible at their job and they can be fought or they can, they can be terrible at their job and still have their job because schools are afraid to pay their buyouts. But then, you know, you have certain players and things like that that can, you know, get kicked off of teams and, th and, and you know, for uh, for smoking a little weed here and there or something like that. And, again, I've made this known many times on my morning show that that is an issue that I care nothing about uh, and, and and needs to be looked at because – and even Kirby said this when uh, when the two Georgia players, uh, Roquan Smith and H.S. Patrick, weren't suspended for the Florida game. He said the – and I'm paraphrasing here. I don't have the exact quote in front of me. But how certain things are viewed in this country, attitudes are changing. And right. so, like, when, when you look at something like that, players are getting kicked off of teams for things like that. But a coach can have, you know, just uh, could, could have a terrible record and not be winning and, and not be doing the things that they need to do. And it doesn't end up mattering because they can't be fired. So the 
the players who are adults, let's keep that in mind. A lot of people like to say, well, they're in college. I'm like, you're 18 years old. You know, I, I've always lived by the old enough to fight, old enough to da, 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 you know. And, and, you know, these, and obviously we don't like have a draft anymore, but still, you know what I mean? Like you can go to the army at 18 and, and, and fight for this country. So the fact that we don't treat these individuals like adults is absurd. They should be treated like adults. They, they should be held to the same standards that normal people do in their jobs. But at the same time, you know, we should also treat them like adults. We should also let them in on what they're earning these schools. And I'm not saying pay them directly. I think there I are, am. well, there are ways that you can do it to where I think you would at, at least slowly start this conversation. Uh, nah, not a conversation. That's a, that's a non-negotiable point in this podcast, my friend. We are paying so you're, you're saying, you're saying, but you're saying, we're, 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 what we're saying is we're doing, we're, we're doing that topic a different day. We will have you back on to discuss that topic. Okay. We've got to okay. move forward on it. Okay. Um, you and I are both long suffering Atlanta sports fans. How about them Falcons? Oh, oh, today was Say what you will. That was a great win. We, I, for those who don't know, you normally record this podcast before NFL games kick off because Sam came back from uh, boots on the ground, if you will, for Georgia, Florida, recording <laughs> after the late games. So that means that he and I both watched the Falcons put it on them Packers. How good does it feel? It felt so good because, look, with with the way that this game was going, it really did see and, – and the way that Aaron Rodgers turned it on. And, and you know, he, he started this against Chicago last week, but he really looked good today against the Falcons. But somehow, some way, Atlanta found a way to win this game. And I tweeted this during the game, and I still stand by this. Brooks Reed better be running every single step in the Georgia Dome three times over this week for that stupid thing he did that caused Atlanta to have that 12 men on the field penalty when they went back and reviewed it. You know, most, because of, the fans, you know, most of the people listening didn't watch the game, right? I, I don't There's care. no point in really digging the minutia of it. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That guy was just casually jogging off the field and got a 12-man penalty. But regardless, the Falcons did a phenomenal thing today by finding a way to win that game. Although you and I both talked about this. They left Aaron Rodgers with 31 seconds on the clock. I thought that was way too long. Fortunately, the Falcons' defense did just enough and stood up when they needed to, and that's been a big problem for Atlanta uh, this season, especially against the San Diego Chargers when the defense just really folded up. But they uh, they did a really good job. I, I got to give them a lot of credit there on that last drive, and, and they're continuing to get much better in the pass rush. That's something that Dan Quinn has done a remarkable job of improving. Yeah, and it's really good, like you said, defensively. Your pass rush is going well. It's amazing how good your coverage looks. So, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, this secondary is not good. I'll go ahead and say it right now. Desmond Trufant is a stud corner. Stud. But, but I know. But outside of him. He's alone, bro. <laughs> outside, it, they're, they're terrible. And so if you can get more sacks and put more pressure on the quarterback, you're going to make them look a lot better. But if you can't do it, then, you know, this that secondary is going to get victimized. And they got victimized at times today by one of the best quarterbacks we've seen in the NFL. I'll take that level of victimization against Aaron Rodgers. Oh, of course, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but but the, 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 one of the things that was the worst was he kept getting out of the pocket and running. And that was driving me nuts. And that's another thing, too. This linebacking core is not very good either. Yeah, I, they're, they're pretty good, actually. It's the downside of man coverage. Um, and when you're running that man, you have your spy running twists. I think that was more a schematic thing than a, a talent thing. Yeah. You've got you've got you've, you've got you've got your inside lineman running a twist and a spy, and he got caught up in the wash three or four times. I saw it's it's something I don't agree with. It's something they do do <laughs> do do um, <laughs> something they do do in uh, Seattle where Quinn's from. So hopefully they can adjust that to the talent levels of the people here um, and the people we're facing. All right, so um, not just is NFL back for us, not just is college football disappointing us, but the NBA's back, Sam. Our Hawks are back, and Dwight Howard pulled in 19 boards on game one. You were famously said on other airways how what a bad fit Dwight was and how <laughs> sad you were about this team. Would you like to eat any crow right now, and would you like any salt and or pepper? I've got Lowry's in the back, I think. I've actually got some uh, some Mike's Hot Honey. Which Fair is enough. Hot I've got event. Tony's, actually, on my desk right now, if you'd like some okay. Tony's. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Yes, I'm going to eat crow here. I think Dwight Howard, at least in these first few games, he looks the part. He looks like he wants to be in Atlanta. He looks like he is is very energized and ready to go this season. And obviously, the free throw shooting is going to be one it's, thing. It is what it is. That's look. That's one of those like look. You go into the bar, you can't complain about the prices. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's something you're going to have to deal with. 
But, you know, he looks good, and he looks like he's already gotten a rapport with Dennis Schroeder. You know, they've had a couple of alley-oops uh, thrown to, uh, from Schroeder to him. And I think that this team, I, I like going into the season with a fresh start because the Falcons, I mean, excuse me, the Hawks, for a lot of the time, even before the season starts, you know what they're going to be. Quite frankly, this team, I think they could be, you know, as high as, you know, third place in the East, and they could probably also be a seventh or eighth seed. I don't know what's going to happen. I think that, that Kyle Korver is slowly transitioning to bench roll with the way that Tim Hardaway Jr. has started the season. And hopefully Tim Hardaway Jr. can continue to play that way because they're going to need him to if Kyle Korver, you know, is, is – Kyle Korver's problem is, you know, he's getting a little longer in the tooth. It's harder for him to constantly run around and, and run off these screens, which is what he did when he first got to Atlanta. Basically, he's just running around like a madman trying to get open, running through three and four screens at a time. And eventually he gets open and shoots a three. But I don't think he's got as much of a shot as he used to. So Tim Hardaway Jr. is going to be vital to this team. Schroeder's going to have to keep playing well. And and I think that, you know, Torian Prince, hopefully he comes along as a rookie. And and quite frankly, Kent Bazemore has got to, you know, he got the big contract. Now he's got to play like it. And I think it's really interesting. Uh, I think you're right. I think while we may be tradition in Corver, I think that we've never had this one thing in Atlanta with Kyle. And that's someone you had to double team on the block. And right. so when, once Dwight gets, I think Dwight's still finding his footing offensively. Once he gets back into some of the form, and we're not saying he's going to be dropping 20 a game anymore, but he still needs to be dangerous in the post, and then you have to double team him because he'll take your one-on-one guy and just eat him alive. If you couple that with some of the, the, the passing fundamentals and the passing philosophies that we've seen out of this Hawks team, I think that could save Corver's legs, keep him coming off those screens, and just have those Denny Green spot-up spot up situations like you see in San Antonio. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and here's one thing, too. I think that with Paul Millsap, there was a lot of questions with the signing of Dwight Howard and giving Kent Bazemore that much money and relying on him more and having Schroeder running the point because Schroeder – I don't think is at the level of distribution that uh, Jeff Teague was at. So I see, and that's where again, I'm, I'm in love with Schroeder when I've seen early, and I think last year at some point I thought he surpassed him as a guard. I think you're right that Teague's probably a better pure passer, right? But I think what Schroeder brings to the table as a total package adds more to your offense. Well, but that, but that, this is what gets back to the point I was trying to make about Paul Millsap. It's there was a lot of concern as to how he would fit. Would he be overshadowed by some of these pieces? That was clearly not the case in game no. one. I mean, you know, he still did his thing, and he looks, quite frankly, just as good as he's looked in a Hawks uniform in these first couple of games. So that's why I think the ceiling could be pretty high for this team. Yeah, I think this is going to actually help Paul a lot because a lot of time with Al, they're both asked to play the four or five responsibilities. By the way, Al Horford, go eat all the poisonous mushrooms. Like, wow. like seriously. Like, the way that he left Atlanta and the way that, you know, his camp came out and said all these terrible things, like, like Paul's, or I mean, uh, Al Horford's dad coming out and basically throwing Atlanta under the bus. And Al Horford now starting to make a stink about all the terrible times he had in Atlanta and stuff. It's like, dude, say something while you're here, okay? Don't go the, be that That makes no route. sense. He would never say something while you're in a place. You don't talk about your job while you're there. Stop. No, don't, no, don't no. Do open that. your mouth. Don't, don't, don't do all this stuff after you've left. He's he's been he's been terrible about all that stuff. And Same, I sports you radio showing. Listen, I agree. Sports you radio showing. You don't go out there and say all this negative stuff. But at the same time, don't act like everything's a hundred percent perfect. And then when you leave, you start to say all this crappy Same, stuff sport, about a your team. Sports, your sports radio showing, bro. No, no, no. Come no, on. No. It's a hundred percent accurate uh. on Al Horford. Al Horford. You know, now that, oh, I mean, I'm so happy I'm in Boston. This is the best place I've ever played and all this stuff. It's like, it's a better run organization. Like, historically, it's a better run organization. Historically, than the Hawks. but, but in the last 10 years, it's a better not, organization than the Hawks. Not, no one's going to fight about what that. What the Hawks are doing right now oh is they're goodness. running themselves. Them, they're running themselves about as good as any organization, no. top to bottom, from Who's promotion. The owner? Who's everything the owner? Right now. Who's uh, the owner? Anthony Wrestler and, and the group with him, including <laughs> Grant Hill, including, uh, including Don't Speak for Square from Seinfeld. I didn't mean to chew Carol off on an Al Horford tangent. Bank. Goodness gracious. Just saying, um, Al Horford let's is talk some more about Bank opening from. week. Uh, we, had, uh, we had the young lady in, in Philadelphia who wasn't allowed to sing the anthem, whose name I'd never heard before, but she has 160,000 followers on Twitter. So if y'all know who she is, I apologize. I made jokes about this last week. I was wrong. 
Um, she wasn't allowed to sing the anthem due to what they called a political statement on her shirt that said, We Matter. The Philadelphia 76ers have obviously walked back from the stance. They released a statement on Friday. We are sorry that this happened. I love when people say that because it acts like a, a, an alien occurred. Like we didn't do nothing, but something happened. Um, after receiving feedback from our players, basketball operations staff, and ownership group, we believe we, were, we the wrong decision was made and seven should have seven should have been allowed to sing. We apologize to her in an effort to move the conversation forward. We have reached out to her, offer her an opportunity to return and perform at our game of her choice. We're waiting to hear back. You could, and the thing is, they, they said that they originally did it to avoid controversy. You do realize that if they'd never done it, there'd be no controversy. Well, are we still supposed to trust the process? That's my question. <laughs> Look, if Joel Embiid's the process, bro, I'm trusted. Look, I don't care what anyone says. They may even have him on a pitch count. He can only play 20 minutes a night. Those 20 minutes, I'm here for. He is a go-to. I'll tell you what. I'm making an announcement right now. Deep Holland's first lock of the year. He is a go-to league pass person. If you see him on league pass and he's doing something impressive, impressive tweet me at Deep Holland 66 I will stop what I'm doing and watch Joel Embiid do work. That is your first First league pass alert of the year. There'll be many to come. I did spring a league pass. Sorry, Susan. She's finding out this way. Sorry about that. <laughs> First of all, he's a great follow on Twitter. So oh, you know, it was Twitter follow. Yeah, you got to you got to go follow Joel Embiid on Twitter. But I feel like the Sixers have some talent. But what the Hawks did to them the other night? <laughs> I mean, it's, oh, it's yesterday still... during the day, baby, we got them. We let you go home early and spend time with your kids. We sent them, we sent them <laughs> home at like five p.m. That's what I'm saying. It's it's still <laughs> it's still a long way to go there, and the, the process. Although the, the, I mean, guess after that first game, they were tr- chanting "Trust the process." But the best thing the Sixers have done all year is homeboy in the stands, giving Russell Westbrook the double birds. And, uh, and the look on Westbrook's face after he they, that guy did that to him. It's obviously, it's like, that is the most Philadelphia thing I've ever seen in my life, other than, like, booing Santa Claus. I will never understand why fans think they can't get knocked out. That, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, dude, what are you doing? And, like, and like for example, going all the way back to the Malice at the Palace, it's like everybody got on Ron Artest. And like, Yo, threw a drink at him. Artest went way overboard. But who the hell's throwing stuff at him, man? Like, like, these are human beings, man. Like, like, like if, if, you're, if you were laying down on the table somewhere and all of a sudden some drink comes flying on you, what are you going to do? Yo, I'll tell you right now, I'm not famous. I'm not a basketball player. If you yell at me in the streets with double fingers in my face, you will hear about it on the news. <laughs> it will make perfect. the paper. Russell Westbrook is a better man than me because he, he's learning us like, oh, get him out of here. And they threw him out. But man, oh, man, that would have been a problem for me. Um, Anthony Davis, speaking of good players on not so oh. great teams, Anthony Davis. Oh, 95 year, points in two games. Last year was rough for him, though, man. He was supposed to be that dude. He ended up um, getting shut down with an injury, not making an All-NBA team and losing $24 million. He's now back. It looks like he's healthy. He looks in great form. But he's still on the, the Pelicans. Yeah, dude rocked 50 points and 18 boards in game one. They still lost. Like, that's the thing. Like, he, I, I feel like, and look, I, a lot of people are like, well, you got to love his loyalty for signing back with uh, signing no, back. I trusted Pelicans. them. They lied. I, no, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't think if I were him, there's no way I would have signed that deal with them. Because what has that franchise given you to make you think that they were going to commit to anything long term? I think I totally agree with you. He got Duke. But at the same time, that it, it's on him, too, because he signed the contract. Eric Bledsoe? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Like, what? Is, is, uh, is, uh, is Eric Gordon still on that team? Like, like what? Who, who is on that team? I don't even know. Look, man, I don't know what they're doing with him there. I hope that we get a free, um, free the brow situation going on there. Same way I feel about Boogie, get him out of uh, Sacramento. I will say this, man, um, about the, uh, the Pelicans, it still remains the only franchise in sports where I can see an easy one-for-one mascot trade with the Utah Jazz. If you want to work in maybe someone else for a three team or get a Pelican in a more appropriate place, that's fine. The I was going to say the Utah Pelicans. Belong... I don't. It fits more than the Jazz. No, but I'll say this: <laughs> you, you are hitting the nail on the head. I have been calling for that for years. I, I, the Jazz needs to go to New Orleans, and yeah, I don't care. You know what? Bobcat would make more sense. You could have done a three way deal, gotten the Hornet name, or I guess the well, they did change from the Pelicans, but anyway, you could have gotten the. The Hornets to Charlotte like they did. The Bobcat could have gone to Utah, and then Jazz could have gone to um, New to Orleans. New Orleans. That was a perfect trade, yeah. 
Yeah, because the Bobcats are all Bobcats. I'm willing to ship the Pelicans to Utah and deal with that later. <laughs> the, the Jazz being in Utah is such an affront. I need to handle it immediately. Uh, opening night, we saw the Spurs blow out the Golden State Warriors. Some of those um, matchup issues that I thought would happen might be winning me hypothetical money when I because I may have bet the under, maybe, maybe not. Who Kawhi knows? Leonard's your first weekend of the NBA MVP, dude. Ugh. That guy is incredible. That guy is unbelievable what he's been able to do. And we're not going to cover every game. We are going to cover games that Pop gives us a great soundbite. They asked Popovich at halftime. Um, they asked if he still gives Steve Kerr advice. His reply is, just, is vintage Pop. I hate <laughs> Steve Kerr. If you ask me anything, I'll tell him to like, urinate in a bucket. <laughs> that was so great. Yeah, I'm <laughs> writing in, uh, like, honestly, like that, that, no, Pop, these. I, I was afraid that we'd lose the Pop fastball when Tim retired. Nah, Pop just reloaded, baby. Pop's still here, baby. And these Spurs are going to be a problem. Um, all right, so we're making the end of the podcast, which means we're talking wrestling. Oh, yeah. Um, right now, as we're do recording this, Hell in the Cell is occurring. It's a raw pay-per-view. I'm watching it on my tablet to talk to Sam. Uh, I do want to go to Talking Smack this week. It's no point in previewing it. But there are three in the Hell in the Cell matches. I want to talk to you about a problem that Daniel Bryan brought to light in a somewhat humorous manner on Talking Smack this week. And I'm quoting now, three Hell in the Cell matches. More is more? Is that the phrase? More is more. More is better. There's more. That's better. Do you know what I think they should do? They should make it four hours. Maybe five hours. With six Hell in the Cell matches. Yeah, no, and, and, and the winner of all six Hell in the Cell matches gets to be champion of the galaxy. That's what want to happen. And then you get your championship when Triple H comes down and beats everybody else up and then puts you on top of them. That's how you become universal champion. Sam, booking joke notwithstanding, <laughs> because that's how we got our second universal champion. Do you, like, I think that this, this, this gimmick pay-per-view, it's tough to do, and I'm kind of piggybacking on something Jim Ross said. And honestly, if you're going to talk pair pro wrestling, piggybacking on Jim Ross, not the worst way to go. Um, I think that it's interesting that they're having the three Hell in the Cell matches. We just got news before uh, we recorded. Looks like the ladies will be going on last, which is an event. It's an amazing event. They're headlining a pay-per-view. They're in a Hell in the Cell for the first time. And if Vince and or Kevin Dunn had pulled the trigger earlier, they could have promoted it properly. But if you're listening to this and you haven't watched it, Go watch Hell in the Cell. The ladies close the show. I assume they're going to burn the house down because Roman and Rusev just put on a pretty good cage, a Hell in the Cell match. My question for you is, when you've got three of these, well, two, two full questions. The first part of the question is, do these gimmick pay-per-views really have a place in a PG environment? Because as you and I grew up on this, some of the spots that we've seen that probably shouldn't have happened, like all the Foley stuff, that's not going to happen now. For better or worse, I think for better. moment of my childhood, though, man, when he fell and off I, that. I, I know it is, but also it's a divorce uh, result from, like, the, the eyes of childhood and realize that Mick Foley probably took years off his life doing that. Well, it's like, it's like I, I don't know if you've been watching South Park this season, but it's a total member berries moment. It's like, you know, it's like, remember when Mick Foley fell off the hill in the cell? You know, it's like, it's just, it's just, it's one of those things where it's, like, really hard to replicate that. And, and that's the thing. Mick Foley doomed any other Hell in the Cell, there have been some pretty good matches after that. I will say that. Like, he and uh, – I know this involved him, but when he was Cactus Jack versus Triple H, that was a really good Hell in the Cell match. And there have been some other ones since then that have been good. I mean, Shane McMahon jumping off the top of the Hell in the Cell uh, at WrestleMania this past year. You know, it's like, what are you doing? But, you know, I, I think that the gimmick Hell in a Cell in general is, is just kind of stale at this point because you mentioned it a second ago. Uh, Roman Reigns and Rusev had a pretty good match. And yeah, I'm, I'm watching it as well. It was a good match. But the cell was unnecessary. They could have had that match out with no cell involved at all. So, you know, it could, like you put it in a no-holds-barred, falls count anywhere scenario, and yeah, it's the exact same thing. So I just think that, I think cage matches in general are good every once in a while, but having an entire pay-per-view built around it, like you, you were getting at with your initial question, the gimmick pay-per-view, yeah, I just I just don't think it's really necessary at this point. Yeah, and it's also tough to try to say, hey, there's only like call it ten major spots you can do inside the cell these days, and we've got to split them over three matches. And so let's just be honest here, because the ladies are going on last, I bet you Owens and Rollins don't go to the cell. I bet you they don't leave the cell. <laughs> like it's hard to break the apparatus and you gotta use it for a later match. And so obviously that's a storytelling quirk and that's something that you and I being annoying overthinking wrestling fans would consider but I, I do think that for people like us it takes something out of it if you've ever seen a hell in the cell live match it's really just an obscured match tough to watch um and i think that's what we're kind of running the risk of now is that we're getting a situation where things have been 
And the, the product's great. Let's not listen to the product as it stands right now, particularly bell to bell action, is better than it's probably ever been in company history. It's just tough to do it three times in a night. It's tough to do it not repeating spots. And it's really tough to do it when, let's just be honest, blood's on the table. And I'm, I'm, I understand it. I'm all for getting the blood out of wrestling. I am not one of those troglodytes. But a little bit of color goes a long way when you're saying that this is, you're trying to convey how dangerous this, this structure is. Um, I do think. Yeah, I got to say something. You know, you're, you're getting the blood out of wrestling, that's fine. As someone that was raised on, you know, ECW is one of the first things I watched. The, again, and this goes back to the nostalgia factor and everything, but man, that that ECW stuff from back in the day, I mean, I don't know if I'd be as big of a wrestling fan as I am now, but I'm in for that. Yeah, uh, Google, Google uh, hepatitis rates for those guys. It's pretty ugly. Um, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How's the Sandman doing? Ugh, not the best. Um, so, uh, lastly, we're going to talk about one last thing in the business. It's something you and I have disagreed upon for the year it's been rumored. Uh, this, this, this is what we've been waiting we got for. got your announcement, you bastard. <laughs> Brock Goldberg, Survivor Series, the weekend before Thanksgiving. I'll hopefully have you back on or have someone on for a, a full Survivor Series preview around that time. But i got to ask, particularly looking at the segment that happened this past Monday in Brock's hometown in Minneapolis. Uh, they were trying to get Brock over as the heel. They're trying to, for folks who don't know what we're talking about, they're trying to get the fans to boo Brock. Tough, always a tough thing to do with Brock Lesnar because he's such an attraction. Doubly tough in his hometown, but they had the greatest man on the microphone in the history of professional wrestling to try to do it, and it fell like ridiculously flat on its face. Flat on its what? face. It fell so flat on, its, flat on its face that they couldn't even announce the match like they wanted to because Vince pulled the plug on the segment because they were chanting Goldberg sucks. And it's like, dude, of course that's going to happen in Brock's hometown. Like, you, you needed to go into, like, old school uh, WCW territory. Like, if that had been in Atlanta or Orlando or old right. school WCW territory, it would have worked. But you go to Brock's hometown, they deserve <laughs> that happening to them for that kind of stupidity. I, and the thing is, I honestly don't know how you do it even in Atlanta because you and I were both at the Raw most recently when Brock came out and the whole, whole place popped like you couldn't believe but I tell you what, if you come out here and you really start healing off, it could have worked in a town that wasn't Minneapolis. I have a second question, and this was floated by Kevin Nash, who, from everything you feel about Kevin Nash, is one of the best wrestling ads ever. Is this another case of WWE saying to a WCW guy, "We're not going to put you, we're going to put you over, but we're not going to put you over. Like we're going to make you look bad on the way there." See, uh, the, the conspiracy theorist in me thinks that that could be a possibility, but the realist in me and the man who has known Vince McMahon's just personality and running his company to want to make as much money as possible doesn't think that's the case. That's that's more of a the way that WCW would do something than the way that this empire that is WWE would do something. And side note on Kevin Nash, he blocked me on Twitter because a few years back, he tweeted something out. It was like first 10 people or whatever that message or that, that tweet me this or whatever. I sent him a personalized video. I was sweet. And so I did it. And then he sends me a DM. That's 75 bucks. I'm like, dude, you can't do that on Twitter. Say you're going to give people a video and then try and charge them 75 bucks. And he didn't like that. And he blocked me. So that, that's my side note. Well, and I know what you're saying about Vince making money. He's done this to be petty at WCW in the past. I'm going to point to the Booker Triple H feud. I'm going to point to... Every feud Brock, uh, Goldberg was in his first run besides the, uh, the Brock one. I'm going to point to um, the way they treated Ray in the 20-minute in the world title cha world championship run. Like, this is not – I know you're saying that you think this is something WCW do. What WCW would have done is they would have shined up the WWF product that came over and made it look even better. What Vince does is he's not just content with winning. He wants to embarrass his competition. That's why Sting picked up a – was it a one and two record in his matches in WWE – that's, I mean, I, I think that you're underestimating the pettiness of, of Vince McMahon. Well, but, but but then why did Vince have Goldberg come in originally, beat his shining jewel, The Rock, and then like a couple of months later go on to beat his other shining jewel, Triple H, for the, the undisputed title at the time? To build, to give it back to them, make them bigger. Like you can't look at the stories as as the, as a small version of the story. You look at the larger, large part of the story, and it always ends with WWE on top. It no, always I, will. I agree. I agree with that, and I, I agree that he wants to put his guys over. But at the same time, I think that in this instance, it, it's it's it seems more about because this is only a one-off for Goldberg. And if for some reason 
it does go well and it does get a good reception, which Minneapolis doesn't make you think it will, but Denver made it seem like it could go well. And if it does, then maybe they do bring Goldberg back for one more match at WrestleMania around his induction into the Hall of Fame because it seems like he's going to headline the 2017 class. So oh, that, that's been leaked already. And the thing is, the internal WWE logic is still, if you're inducted, you don't work the, work the event. So I think this is going to be his last match. I think it's going to be very interesting to see um, how they book it and how they want to sell it to us as the fan base. What are your predictions for the in-ring stuff? Because you and I have talked about the build. I think that with Goldberg's increased chops based on um, hosting all those television shows and Paul Heyman, they can still do this. They, they'll be fine. I think the build will get there. The money's going to get made off selling the names on the card. There's obviously an, a well-documented uptick in ticket sales and pay-per-view buys when Brock Lesnar's name is on the card. Add in the nostalgia factor of Goldberg, and we're talking not just – my audience right now of so many laps and casuals, but there are laps and casuals right now who are like, I remember Goldberg and I know Brock Lesnar. I'm buying this no matter what. And so the question becomes, what do you think they're going to give us that on that Sunday in November in the ring? This is going to make you happy when I say this. It's not going to be a great match. I, and I, I don't think it could be a great match because right. both guys are, are kind of the same guy. They're clunky. They're not super great technically. Goldberg, obviously, and you hold this against him when he injured Bret Hart. I mean, he has been shown to be an extremely clunky wrestler at times. I think he, I think he was probably a little better in the ring than a lot of people want to give him credit for. But oh, at the same, he definitely time, was. Yeah, but at the same time, he's done a lot of training with kickboxing and things like that. You know, you were seeing all these things from from his training. He looks to still be in really good shape. So. I think I think it could be better than people think. I don't think it's going to be great. It's going to close out a long pay-per-view. It's looking like it's going to be a four-hour long pay-per-view, which that goes back to what Daniel Bryan is saying. Sometimes too much is too much. But I still think it could be a decent match. I, there's no way Goldberg wins it. But yeah. I, I, I really hope that they don't make it a squash. And I don't think yeah. they will. But I, I hope that it, I hope that I'm wrong and that they turn it into a real good match. I hope it's I think it's even better than you and I, than than the majority of us think it is. Look at you, you're giving. No, no, the- I just no, I, I think that it's going to be interesting to see the story they want to tell. I think if they give him more than 15, it's going to be a problem. I think that you can't put it on last. I think it can be last. It, it, you just it cannot be the last match. It's going show. to be last. There's no it, way it's not. It's you Brock- and I will you and I will talk offline about a bet we're going to make about that. Um. It makes no business sense to put it on last. It's a bad business decision to put it on last. Uh, I think that the story they tell is going to be, and I, you know, just maybe spoilers match, but it's going to be the 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 graying wolf come in to fight one more time, and it's going to be one of perseverance. I think it's going to take two F fives to put him down. We'll see a jackhammer teased. I don't know if we'll ever see one hit before this run is over, unless he gets a a a. a, 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 a Curtis Axel or Bo Dallas, Jabra Chase, <laughs> um, run in during a promo to get us a spear and a jackhammer so we can all feel good about ourselves. Uh, he was very interesting and very effacing on uh, Jim Ross's podcast this week. He said he put the trucks on and was like, how are we going to do this? <laughs> so, but uh, like, <laughs> for, for all the shape he's in, he's a 49 year old man. Like He's very realistic, but he's also very excited from what I can hear. He's a guy who always loved the business itself, but didn't love the business of the business. Uh, one of the big problems with his first run in WWE was Vince would say, hey, I need you to work these extra dates. He goes, those are extra dates. It's out of my contract. And while most people, because of the carny background of pro wrestling, would say, oh, those are carrying in the back and would just do it. <laughs> Goldberg's like, I signed that contract for a reason. I think there was an injury to Triple H, and they asked him to go work the uh, the Australia tour so they could have a world champion. And that's why they gave the belt to him originally, actually. They said, we need a world champ on that tour, and he wouldn't do it. And so I think when you watch him interact with the fans and talk about how much, and even, you know, you can say it's a work, but I think, that especially pieced together with the last 12 years of interviews, there's a lot of shooting saying that he wants to come back and be a superhero for his kid. And that I think that wrestling's best when you can blur the lines between work and shoot, and when you can bring a piece of real motivation to the ring, I think Goldberg has done that effectively in his story, and now it's up to Paul to sell us on Brock. And I really, if there's anyone who's going to do it, it's Paul Heyman. That was very, uh, that was very well put. I, I got to give you a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> that was well done, Dan. I may have overthought was, pro wrestling just a little bit this time again. But get, let me say one thing real quick. Can we let Brock talk some? No. Good brief. We've tried it. I don't think he's that bad. Babyface Brock didn't work, man. Babyface, I'm talking to myself, Brock doesn't work. 
No, I'm not saying babyface Brock, but let him talk some. I mean, good grief. If the option is let Brock talk or let Paul Heyman talk, keep the party going. There needs to be there needs to be one like like when they're face to face at each other at that last Raw before Survivor Series. It needs to be a, he and he did this once I believe last year. Is it the last year or the year before where Heyman was talking and Lesnar ripped the mic out of his hand and just screamed at the person for like ten seconds. That's well, all. I'll tell, tell you what would work really well if you saved that. I don't care about your kids. I don't give a shit about your kids. Oh, that was so this. great. If you oh, saved it for so this. Or if he redelivers the same line, people will pop for that. That would give him the heel heat you want. It would give babyface Goldberg the babyface shine that you want. It would really set. If that's if that's our go home going into Toronto, just drop, drop the mic. I'll take my money. I'm there. I'm I legit there. legit felt bad for Heath Slater. <laughs> like, like I was like like I know that, and I'm trying to tell myself in my head, this is wrestling, dude. It's not real. It's but but I'm relax. like I'm, I legitimately felt bad for Heath Slater. Well, it's funny because. <laughs> You do feel bad because that's and that's one of the things that I think Brock is underestimated, undervalued as a pro wrestler. When you watch him sell stuff, he gives. Like, he <laughs> I don't give a like, shit about you kids. <laughs> well, 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 there's that, but I was talking about like the little, the little things in the ring that you don't think about his physicality or match work. But like when he took when they did the lead up to Royal Rumble a couple years ago, him taking those curb stops from Rollins, he sold the shit out of those cold. He did, he did, he did. No, you're when right. we were in Atlanta, he sold that RKO. He sold that. He did. He did. I was like, he was like stumbling when he stood up. I was like, that's like, and that's why people say Brody loves business. Brody may not love everything about business. He loves performing. He loves entertaining, and yeah. that's why I think comes to, uh, comes Survivor Series. While they won't close the show, they will put on a hell of an entertaining match, and we'll all say, man, it was really nice to see that old man get beat up by Brock Lesnar one more time. <laughs> uh, Sam, man, do you have any last words for the for the listeners? Um, not really. Just thank you for having me on. I, you know, I love doing things like this. And again, you know, anytime you need me, I'm, uh, I'll be around. All right, man. Well, uh, tell them where to find you one more time. Cause I'm not reading your blurb again. <laughs> uh, just follow me on Twitter at Sam J Franco. You can also uh, follow my radio station, 960 the ref on Twitter at 960 the ref. Uh, follow the mouths of the South podcast on Twitter at M O T S podcast and dirty South soccer at dirty South sock. That's dirty South S O C. Awesome, man. Thanks for coming on. I am D. Palmer, your host, as always. Uh, five-star reviews, iTunes store. Email us at udpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find me this week. I'm, on, of course, on all our Super Tuesday stuff. We recorded the reviews for Arrow and Legends tomorrow earlier this morning. We also recorded a brand-new character corner for Doctor Strange to get you ready for the new Marvel movie that's dropping at the end of the week. I'll be recording... I'll be recording uh, the Flash and Arrow, or Flash, excuse me, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. reviews on Wednesday, go up Thursday. And I'm also going to be a guest on my former podcast, uh, dude, you crazy dun, on dun, Tuesday dun. to go up on Wednesday. It's going to be like, honestly, uh, a stranger in my own house. We're going to see how it feels. <laughs> um, I'm probably going to um, be a lot more entertaining because I don't have to host anymore. And I don't have to think about anything. Me and Chad Floyd are going to put it in right there. Um, that was your show, guys. This is your outro. See you next week. <laughs>